Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm Samara Concepcion and I'm here in conversation with Kelly Brogan. Kelly, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. I've been savoring you and your work ever since Ian McKenzie introduced me to you. And the very first video I came across of you was one in which you said that if you want to control a population, you commandeer their rituals of initiation and you focus their attention and energy on productivity, outcomes, and measurable metrics of their externalized self-worth. And that is done through the medicalization of the birth process. So before we dive into that, which I'm sure we will, I really want to appreciate your, acknowledge and appreciate your unique path, which has led you to um, being such a visionary, investigative, and paradigm-shifting voice in the field of human health. In my understanding, you were once a, re a reproductive psychiatrist, and at some point down the line decided to step out of that medical model of care to serve people in a different way. And so my first question for you is, what was it that had you step out of that paradigm. Mm. So in psychology, it's referred to as cognitive dissonance, right? Where you are confronted with a reality through your senses that is at odds with a pre-existing belief-based paradigm, right? And so I had an experience where I was able to put into remission on paper, lab work, black and white, you know, print, um, a condition that I had only ever learned was chronic, recidivistic, and potentially even ultimately disabling, um, called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is now a very run-of-the-mill autoimmune condition that is um, especially common in postpartum populations and extending through, you know, uh, menopause and beyond in women. And I put this condition into remission through lifestyle change, which I was called to explore because I already knew the limitations of the medical model as far as what was on offer for me as a new patient. I had never had a health condition diagnosis before. And so I said, you know, listen, I'm not interested in that. I went the lifestyle route. I put it into remission and it was like the whole machinery was like, <laughs> you know, like it just couldn't, it couldn't keep churning because I had never learned that you could, first of all, put a condition into remission. That's not on offer in the allopathic system. Management is on offer, right? So I've never learned that. I had certainly never learned that lifestyle change and chiefly nutrition had any real relevance outside of, you know, a low salt diet for a heart disease patient or, you know, don't drink the 7-Eleven Big Gulp if you're a diabetic. Uh, you know, I, I've never learned anything about nutrition. And, and you ask any doctor, this is very commonplace. I had probably literally an hour in a decade of training. And I could not make sense out of having achieved this outcome, right? And so something I could see and witness and, you know, choose to integrate in a particular way. And what I already knew to be true, which is that, you know, the body is a machine that breaks down easily. It requires management through knowledgeable mechanics. And, you know, that is a lifelong process of just trying to get out from from under, you know, the bombs that are dropping, right? It's a survival game. And that was when I chose, you know, the left-hand path. I chose to, to walk into the wild unknown away from what I had amassed, oh, I don't know, $200,000 of debt and a decade of servitude, you know, blood, sweat, and tears, and uh, no small amount of trauma to call myself an expert in. And, um, and the rest is history. You know, I never, I never looked back and it's been a magic carpet ride ever since. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Kelly. There's something very valuable to me in having that much perspective and understanding about um, a paradigm you were once very much a part of and now and very much believed in and now no longer are through having explored possibilities beyond it. And I'm always particularly interested in talking to people who have lived in both camps and who to me can really speak to what is possible and what isn't possible within those different models of care. And this actually really makes me want to clarify something about this documentary film that I'm in the early stages of creating, Birth, A New Story. And that's that 
in no way am I here to say that the industrial model of birth or the medical model of birth is bad or wrong. I'm much more. I'm, I'm here for that. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I'm what, kidding, I'm I'm more, <laughs> what I'm much more interested in is exploring and clarifying that this model, that the medical model of birth is very much informed by a particular paradigm, right? A yes. particular field of belief, a particular worldview that inevitably is going to influence the way that birth unfolds within it, right? Yeah. Um, and that there are other ways of bringing new life into the world. There are other ways of moving through the birth process um, that, that at the center really hold an innate respect and understanding of the innate intelligence of birth. Um, and within which what, what is most important is really how the birthing woman is feeling. Yes. Right. So, um, my next question for you is, so how does the medical model of birth perceive a birthing woman and her baby and her innate and her ability to give birth? And how does that then inform the many routine medical interventions that have become such a normalized and unquestioned part of modern maternity care? Mm. I, I love this question and it's so important. I'm, I'm kidding and not kidding uh, when I say that, you know, there's a, a, a sort of valuation uh, that can be cast on the comparison between, let's say, a home birth and a, a medical birth. Um, but really, the truth is that these are different paradigms of consciousness and they are totally internally consistent. Right. So when I was one of the first 300 psychiatrists to specialize in medicating pregnant women, and breastfeeding women with psychotropic medications, I did so because I thought I was helping them, right? I am still that woman. I did not die, right? I am still that woman. She is still a part of me. And when I explore that part of me, what I find is there's a whole set of encoded beliefs that fundamentally respond to the trigger of fear in a particular way. And the way that those, you know, beliefs drive this part to respond are to grasp the wheel tighter, right? To seek control, to manage all of the uncertainties. And that part does not believe that the universe is benevolent. That part does not have a connection to source, God, inner being, whatever you want to call it. That part is out in the wilderness, shivering and freaking terrified, right? Like that part only knows trauma. I'm speaking for myself. Okay. And she knows the defenses that are effective in mitigating the fear, the sensations of fear in the body. Right. And she will recruit others in her reality that also share those programmed beliefs. And she will then have affirmation look, you see, I did it well, right? I did the good thing, you know, managing this scary situation and, and look how good it turned out because I got the help I needed, right? But at the core of her belief system is I am broken, I am powerless, I cannot do this and I need something that I cannot source. That powerlessness is <laughs> at the root of all suffering, right? And it should be because it's an illusion. And illusions should hurt because otherwise, why would you awaken to the opportunity to integrate a deeper, more blissful truth? So when I was that woman, when I believed that a woman who didn't schedule an elective C-section uh, and opt in for an epidural was like a masochistic freak, which I did believe, right? When I believed that you were irresponsible and reckless, for not taking your psychiatric medication when you know you otherwise are going to have dangerous symptoms that are going to put you and your unborn baby at risk when i believed that birth was fundamentally a medical problem that needed to be managed by appropriate um you know experts in an appropriate setting all of that made sense it makes internal sense that's why i 
every day we'll recite that Bucky Fuller quote that says you don't you know, change the system by, I'm paraphrasing, by, by fighting the pre-existing system, you create a new one that renders it obsolete. And my rallying cry all these years since, you know, my first natural birth 13 years ago has been just make sure that it's not just women, by the way, that women and men know what is possible. Just make sure they know what is possible because this is not a science game. This is not an info war. This is a, a process of igniting within you the remembrance. And that is an embodied sensation-based experience, right? When I, when I speak to another woman about what birth could be for her, and I say, you are wild. You are part of this natural world. You are built to, it makes me teary <laughs> every mm -hmm. time, you know, like you are built for something that no one ever told you you are. And you, your body is literally that channel for an amount of energy that you have not even touched. It's not pain, it's not pleasure, it is literal vital force that is meant to channel through you, through your body. And when you experience that, and when you surrender into the flow of that, you can never unknow that. Never. <laughs> For the rest of your life, anytime you're scared, you will hold that scared part. And she will feel held in your arms and everything's going to be okay. You will never live in a random universe where you are subjected to bad luck and bad timing and bad genes and bad germs and whatever. That's over. This is what initiation is. It is moving beyond the illusion that is going to keep you in the small self. And you can't do that until that small self dies, right? And that's why it's set and setting, right? You don't, you don't, well, I guess some folks can, but you, you know, most of us require the gaze of others who can see our grandeur before we can and when we can't. They, we require that. I required that, right? Whether that's a doula, a midwife, a partner, a sister, a mother, whatever, right? That is what the birth setting affords you, right? So that is why I've even, you know, found, dug up scientific research that speaks to how a vaginal birth in a hospital, you know, looking at through the lens of the microbiome, let's say, and a, and a vaginal birth at home are not the same thing. This is not just mechanics. This is not just about your healthy baby and be happy that you got that. This is about your initiation and the reclamation of your feminine power. If we don't have this right now, we are done, right? So the ignition of this within every single woman, and by the way, I've spoken to this reality and I know many have, this is also your masculine partner's opportunity to initiate himself as your protector, right? And when you are in that setting, in that paradigm of consciousness that says, you don't have this power, you are a body machine, you require the mechanic and silly woman, focus on the healthy baby. Why are you being so selfish, right? That says, you don't know what's going on in your body. Let me tell you, oh, your body's doing it wrong. Let me speed it up. Let me slow it down. Let me cut it open. When you enter that paradigm of consciousness, not only are you consenting to ultimately what, what I believe through my lens is your own violation. And by the way, we do this all the time. Okay. Where we most commonly do it as women is in relationships, right? As codependents in relationships with you know, partners who do not meet our needs and we stay and we stay and we stay and we stay. This is a part of the victim consciousness paradigm, which is built on this parasitic codependent dynamic. And it just is that way. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It just is that way. That's the nature of it. You surrender your power. The system lives off of your power. The moment you take your power back, that system has, is irrelevant to you, right? But it's also your, your partner who is colluding in this whole, you know, sort of presenting on a, a platter at the altar, right, of, of safety and security and, you know, good outcomes, your co-creative power, right? So as a polarity, as a masculine feminine polarity, you have a circuit of power that is cosmic, right? That is divine. And when that is interrupted, you're just free agents, you know, just 
trying to appear like good people doing the right thing. And that it's, a, it's amazing, right? Like the dimensions, the reverb, let alone what it means for a baby to be born in a way that is fundamentally different than babies have ever been born since the dawn of humanity. Um, let alone that, I am just talking about the adult experience. There is a tacit consent that can only be delivered. Of course, that's the nature of informed consent. When you know what else is out there, right? What are the risks and benefits? What are the alternatives? And unless somebody has told you, this is what birth can be for you. It could be your lifetime experience. It could be literally your one organic opportunity. Because trust me, I have watched many inorganic opportunities, you know, of self-initiation that come through coming off of psych meds or something like that, right? A death, a divorce, whatever. This could be your inbuilt organic opportunity to initiate to your most expanded version of yourself, to tap into something that you will never lose a connection to, to live a fear-free life. If I tell you that and something in you is like, yes, uh, yes, I want, oh my God, I listened to you, that feels so good, then you're going there. You know, you're, it's, it's like a fait accompli, right? But if you never heard somebody say that, right? Like I had a birth in a birthing center, my first birth. I did not know a single woman who had had a home birth, her first birth. If I had known just one, it would have changed my entire life because the landscape of what's possible would have shifted. And then I would have been potentially attracted to that version of, of expression. But that's why I get stuck on this. Like you, you gotta know it's possible. And then if it's not for you, you cannot rush this process, right? If you are not ready, you are simply not ready. And there's nothing anyone can do about it. There's nothing you should do about it. But if there is some small part of you that says, yes, I want that, then it's a matter of beginning to assemble the mandala of that new belief system, of that new reality, normalizing that. You watch the movies, you listen to discussions, right? You talk to people, you read the articles, you normalize what it is to reclaim the experience of a sacred birth. And then it's yours. Mm. Mm, absolutely. Uh, there's a couple of places I wanna go from here. Just gonna feel into, yeah. Well, so one, one thing that I'm um, talking about possibilities beyond the medical model of birth. Uh, one of the things that this documentary truly wants to offer to a larger audience is something that I consider an essential missing piece in our collective understanding of birth. And that's our, understand our understanding of the hormonal physiology of birth. In other words, the innate intelligence of the birth process. And in no way do I want to reduce it to yeah. the hormonal physiology of birth, because of course birth is, is a force which I believe is way way greater than us and we can't even begin to comprehend through the minds but it's really interesting for me to observe that when people have this missing piece actually understand what is required for birth to unfold optimally for mothers and babies like it it just simply doesn't make much sense at all to give birth in hospital anymore or to give birth surrounded by strangers and beeping yeah. machines and you know so so this is something that um yeah that I'd, I'd definitely love to to bring up with you is is that yes for this for this design for this blueprint uh for this hormonal blueprint of birth to unfold a woman needs to be feeling safe yeah held unobserved, undisturbed, and therefore able to truly surrender to the altered state that birth intends to be. And from that place, she can truly follow her innate body wisdom, right? And, um, and yeah, it's, it's, so, so this is the thing that we can't pretend anymore that where we give birth with whom doesn't, doesn't matter, matter. <laughs> right of course it does and you know when you speak to many birth keepers like myself traditional midwives who are still practicing the ancient ways the focus well firstly what's rooted in 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 the way of holding birth is this deeply felt reverence 
and respect for the innate intelligence of birth, but also this understanding that birth is an altered state and that we need to treat it as such. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we could kind of go into what is possible in birth. I mean, I'd love to hear more about your your experience, perhaps more on a, yeah, if you're open to sharing yeah. that with us. Yeah, so I, so yeah, that's certainly why I mentioned, you know, the, the Terrence McKenna set and setting uh, the relevance of that, because it is, as you're describing, um, this very, very delicate and very sacred altered state. I love, I'm a huge David Data fan, and I love to look at the world through complementarity and through the lens of polarities, right? And specifically, um, masculine and feminine energies. He talks about, you know, the masculine is consciousness and the feminine is, uh, is love and the play of energy. Right. And so if we, if we describe childbirth as being the most right uniquely feminine expression, as I was saying earlier, what are the conditions for the feminine flower to bloom? Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I know in, so I'm very interested in, in how this plays out in relationship and romantic relationship. Right. Cause I've done it wrong. I don't, I don't know my whole life. Um, and so, you know, for the feminine energy to express and bloom and flow unfettered, right. For it to be that ocean, that torrent, it requires, you know, for the river to flow, it requires banks, right. She requires, as you said, that container, because otherwise she would be, you know, recklessly naive to express that energy in a setting where it could really get her in trouble, right? Or it could really pose a risk for her. And so what does that container look like? The container for her to express in wild abandon necessarily mm -hmm. is a safe container. Right. So how you define safety, listen, I'm sure there are women the world over who have had ecstatic, empowering, self-initiatory births in a hospital. I've never met one. I'm sure they exist. Right. Because they have defined that as their container. For most of us, you know, we resonate with what Ina McGaskin would call the sphincter law. Right. Where you don't open your sphincters in a setting that is unsafe. Right. And most of us define safety as being this, you know, energy of I am walking, I am the king, right? Walking the perimeter of the castle. Never you worry, queen, right? Like I've got you. I've got you. You don't have to think about a thing. You don't got to plan a thing. You know, I will make sure all of your needs are met. I will take care of you and I will create the conditions for you to simply be in that energy that is so deliciously you and you don't even know how amazing it is because we are both bearing witness to this miracle right and so that masculine container in my opinion is not on offer it's literally not on offer and what is is a paltry surrogate right so it's a subtle, you know, uh, data would call it the difference between uh, ravishment and rape, right? It's a subtle but very important distinction. When you have the energy of the protector without the heart, right? Without the love, without the connection, then it's called control and it's called mm -hmm. violation, right? Otherwise, it's a dance, right? And so if as a woman, I am wired to require that kind of containment before I can open, then I am going to sense on a deep level that is far beyond my conscious mind when it's not there. And what's going to happen when it's not there is I am going to use my backup plan. <laughs> and my backup plan is control-based, right? My backup plan is to say, okay, no man here. I'm going to be, I'm going to man up. Right. That's what so many of us have been doing our whole lives. Right. So if there's no safe man here, if there's no safe masculine container and I'm speaking, hopefully energetically, right, like the masculine energy field. It's not like literally an individual with a penis has to be standing there. In fact, I think probably shouldn't be standing there. That's my perspective. However, I'm talking about the container. Right. So if I go out to, to dinner with my girlfriends and I know my sensitivities and I, I know I can't relax if I don't know exactly how long we're going to be together. That's like one of my weird things. Like I need to know when the night is ending. What time are we going to be out till 10? OK, cool. Then I can relax. I create these masculine containers for myself. Right. Uh, all the time. 
So when that's not there, then I resort to control-based tactics. Then I resort to, you know, making sure that I am securing what it is that I'm here to secure. And I know like birth plans can come into this, you know, just sort of like, okay, right? Like you're with me, right? You've got me, right? Everybody's going to be there for me, okay? And it's the energy is, it, it like seems like it's it's in service of the woman's experience, but it it can never be because her nervous system knows when the conditions are not met. And that's why in relationships that look the same way these paradigms in allopathic system look, women will start to try to control their men, nitpick and, you know, like solution oriented, driving the ship kind of a thing because they don't feel fundamentally safe with whatever the man is offering. So this is a dynamic problem, right? Mm -hmm. So it's up to every single woman to create the conditions. First of all, understand what her needs are, right? You might need music. You might not need music. You might need your mom in the room. That might be the worst thing ever, right? Like what are the conditions for your safety? This is a deep question. It's taken me decades to discover what my needs are for safety in different contexts. And by the way, how to start to provide those to myself on a regular basis, uh, because it's ultimately my responsibility to recognize whether or not my needs can be met in a, in a given situation, in a, you know, by a given source and to leave if they can't be. Otherwise, it's like I say, it's like trying to buy eggs from the hardware store. It's like you can insist that they sell eggs, but they don't sell eggs. Okay, so you got to go to the supermarket or throw some chickens, even better. Um, so I think that that is the first requirement, like understand what safety means to you, because absent that you're swimming upstream as a woman. And it may look like you're doing all the things to create your experience, but ultimately your experience is not available because of that sphincter law, because we don't open when it's not safe to open. So safety feels to me almost like the first portal. It's like the first Inanna portal, like the deeper she goes into the underworld. So once that essential need for safety is met, um then there is there is this potential opening for for kind of tapping into that kind of primal like innate primal uh wisdom and um yeah i just wanted to hear your thoughts on that i was on just that. Yeah, I'm reflecting on that is it's such a it's like a such a subtle but essential it's like a trick right because if you go into a hospital why do you go to a hospital you go there to be safe, right? You go there to have your safe birth experience, right? Just in case, you know, you have a breech baby, just in case this horrible thing happens, you go there. It's the just in case is the bait that people take, right? So you're going there because you already know safety is essential, right? But it's like, what's on offer? It's like, it's like your lover saying, I'm going to keep you safe. And then he locks you in a cage in the basement. He's like, you're safe. You see, nothing can get you here. <laughs> you're like, but what? I'm, I'm here to live my life. Like, that's not safety. And I know you're concerned about me falling and tripping on the sidewalk or somebody raping me or whatever. But like, that's not the version of safety I was hoping for. Right. So mm -hmm. it's this it's this deep metaphoric um, you know, story about how we can take the bait when our, our, our compass is really pointing us in the right place, right? Like, yes, you require safety and it, it comes from you. You direct what that looks like. You must direct it. It's not, a t it cannot be a template that is imposed upon you ever. This is a hyper personal, hyper individualized experience. And what makes me feel safe is totally different than what somebody else. I mean, of course there's overlap, but when you go into the hospital, because you think this is where safety is, and that is such a logical assumption, it really is. It makes a lot of sense that people would take that bait. It's just that it's literally not available there. It's not unless you could project upon it so sufficiently that you bring that energy. I mean, again, I've never met somebody who has, I'm sure it's possible, but like, as far as I can tell, it's not what's for sale there. What's for sale there is the belief that you cannot do this on your own. You don't know what it requires. And there's no such thing as this feminine 
self-initiation. There's no such, it's not even relevant. I'm a psychiatrist. You know, the etymology of psychiatrist is doctor of the soul. In my mm -hmm. entire Ivy League training, I never, as far as I can recall, heard the word soul one time. It's not relevant. You know what I did here? Dopamine, serotonin, monoamines, catecholamines, receptors. You know, I heard about like half-lives and all sorts of, you know, pharmacologic terminology. That's what I heard. So <laughs> that, the, the relevance of the unseen, the relevance mm -hmm. of the connection to a benevolent flow of energy that is here to align you, the relevance of your body as the expression of you for you as consciousness to bear witness to, it's just not even a thing. It's not, I don't know how else to say it. Like it's not even a thing there. So if you want, and you may not want this, but if you want to have an experience of what childbirth can be, which is a combination of like, you know, winning a triathlon, right? It's a combination of that physical feat, you know, and also um, this emotional trial, right? It's the vision quest for the woman, right? Where you confront your deepest fears, which are ultimately of mortal fears, right? You confront them and you blast through them. And then it's also a spiritual reconnection to where it is that you've closed off and you are suffering because of it. And you always will until that channel is open again. And you begin to live life from this space of like inner guidance, impulse led living, right? Intuition based living, desire based living, where you start to trust yourself and trust your embodiment and trust what your emotions are telling you about how it is that you've diverged from your deeper truth. Hmm. That is on offer, right? when you create the conditions for your most um, expressed feminine energy, right? So it's, it's like, it's really not even a relevant consideration. So if you get stuck just in what and how we define safety, which by the way, how it's defined in the hospital is not dead, <laughs> right? Like if you're not dead, which is interesting, right? Because like C-section, I don't know, I think the mater maternal morbidity is like 3.6 fold higher than it is for vaginal birth. So it's, there's so many inversions, right? So the, the conditions are actually creating a higher likelihood for the very thing that they're most afraid of. It's a labyrinth, right? It's like a hall of mirrors of a lot of distortions and inversions. However, if you want to collude with a staff around this prioritization of crying, you know, baby emerging from vagina, not dead mom, not dead baby, and whatever you think, you know, is the path to that. And that is how low the ceiling of your desires is. Then maybe it makes sense. But anything else, it just, like you said, it just doesn't even make sense. It's just not even relevant. I think that's a much more helpful way to look at it because there's so many ways in which, like, since I've moved beyond pharmaceutical living for well over a decade now, I don't sit with my kids every day and say, should we take a Tylenol? I don't know. What are the pros and cons? And what does the research say? And I don't know, you know, have a draw out a diagram. No, it's just not even relevant to the paradigm of living and consideration that we flow in. That's the, the expression of that Bucky Fuller quote. Like mm -hmm. how, how is it that you can possibly get to a place where the considerations that are relevant, prioritized, and operationalized in an allopathic set setting, just like don't even matter to you. It's not that they don't matter, but they're just defined so differently that you just don't think that way. And it doesn't mean, as I'm saying, that you wanna have a reckless birth and you don't care if you die or your baby dies. Quite the contrary, right? It means that you are personally expressing what safety is in a way that an institution could never actually offer you. And that's why if you align with, you know, it's often called like a midwife, right? Like if you align with a midwife who is in the consciousness of allopathy, you'll have the same struggles at home. And that was, since you asked, you know, that was um, more my experience with my first birth. It was more of just a, a marathon. Like I, you know, 17 hours of back labor, um, lots of vomiting and I did it, right? It was almost like this masculine feat because remember what I said, when women do not feel safe and contained, by an external masculine energy created by the conditions of their needs being met, they enact a defensive structure that is a surrogate for that. 
we all know that as women, we can do a lot of things better than a lot of the men around us. Right. And so I was, I was bringing that fire. Right. And I got this baby out, you know, no interventions, but it was very much from that energy of like, I'm going to cross the finish line of this marathon. You know, if it kills me kind of a thing, it was not a beautiful experience. It was not a sacred experience. It was not uh, anything other than really, you know, what you get out of an athletic experience when you're like, wow, I didn't know I could do that. I don't know. I could summit that mountain. I don't know. I could run, you know, that, that far or that fast or whatever. When I decided to have a home birth with my second experience, that is when my connection to every woman, literally it felt like since the dawn of time was restored and I could draw on a field of energy that I was otherwise living out in the cold away from in isolation. And this reconnection serves me. It's why it brings tears to my eyes, serves me to this day because I am not alone anymore. And I am not scared, you know, like fundamentally. And it doesn't mean I don't feel afraid. It just means that that illusion of disempowerment is the, the veil is lifted. It's not true. And so if I ever feel scared, you know, ashamed, frustrated, honestly, rageful, you know, if I feel that spectrum of so-called negative emotions, it's because I'm encountering a part of me that is still holding beliefs that are consistent with my own victim consciousness, that are consistent with my own disempowerment. And they're hurting me. It hurts. It sucks to feel those because they want to be integrated. They want to be held in that light of this huge fabric of the natural world, of the feminine, this huge creative energy field where everything is not only okay, it is extraordinary, right? And so that reframe is now how I live my life. And it started, you know, in that with my second birth, it started with that experience of also the wildness I mentioned, right? When I was free in my living room to like moan and, you know, orate, you know, in the, in these ways that I had never, you know, I'm like a buttoned up professional in my white coat, you know, and, uh, I've done a lot of rewilding since then, but you know, for me, that was like a revelation and only in that altered state do most of us access the disinhibition to express that way. And then you're like, Oh, who is that? <laughs> you know, like That was, that was pretty wild. That was pretty, pretty amazing, you know, and that is, um, it's a liberation event that you can't unknow. Mm. Mm. That you can't unknow. This brings me to something that um, a beloved teacher of mine, Sheila Kamara Hay says, which has always stayed with me. She says that we give birth the way we live. Yeah. So our birth will be, you know, the way we approach or enter our birth is often very coherent with the way we live our lives, right? So if we if we're used to outsourcing our, pa our power, believing that someone else knows better than us what is right for us and our babies, then of course, you know, that will be reflected to some extent in our, in our choices of where to give birth and with whom. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, I just want to interject though, because I'm thinking back, you know, when I, get, when I had my first daughter, I was just, just, waking up and not even whatever that phrase is annoying how about i just say i was just beginning to feel empowered enough to hold a different opinion and perspective than the cultural context that i was in okay and mm -hmm. i remember was steeped in research it's all i did every day was you know read pubmed articles analyze statistics and try to essentially convince women that taking these meds was in their best interest, I, of course, non manipulatively, but because I knew that was right. And I wanted to find the science to back me up. You can find the science to back up anything as we well know. Mm -hmm. I had a natural birth with first, I had an obstetrician and then I just didn't like her. And so then I decided to choose a midwife. Why? So that I could be the MD know it all. That's literally why I chose to work with a midwife. So she wouldn't challenge me and I could make the decisions. <laughs> I have a very large shadow material, <laughs> like reservoir. Okay. So at least now, at least now I know. Um, so that I chose a uh, midwife and I had this natural birth. I didn't mention this before, but it's very relevant. Why? Because of the science. 
that I had researched. I said, neurotically, I'm not having fetal monitoring, an episiotomy, induction. I'm not having ultrasounds. I'm not, I mean, not that I'm not having them, but I'm not having them unless I decide based on my assessment of risks, benefits, my understanding of, you know, teratogenicity, my understanding of fetal outcomes, that it's what I want. It was a control thing, interestingly, right? So that's literally why I had a natural birth. I did not remember the Hashimoto story. That didn't happen until 10 months after my first pregnancy. I didn't know anything about lifestyle medicine, natural birth, like bohemian stuff. I certainly wasn't in like the goddess field of like feminine reclamation. Please, I would have rolled my eyes at it. That is why I had a natural birth. Okay, so what's interesting to me is, yes, it's a reflection of where you're at. And what is funny is that there's a whole cohort of women who are in that neurotic, controlling, I'm right, you know, I got this, I'm my own man and woman kind of vibe, who honestly, if they had access to the science that would support the perspective that, and that, you know, literally less than 30% of obstetrics is based on tier one evidence. Like this is just the consensus of these largely male and masculinized female physicians, right? Like if they knew that, would they still choose it? And so that's why obviously with the, you know, democratization of information on the internet, you can know it if you want to, you can know the stats, you know, on these interventions, you can know that they're not mm -hmm. evidence based. You can know that, and then you can choose to forego interventions and even have a home birth, not because you're trying to have some experience that, uh, you know, Kelly's going to cry about, right? But because you know that that's actually more aligned with the outcomes that are a priority to you, which is a living baby and a living mother. So <laughs> that's what's funny. It's like, it's not just like, oh, once you're spiritually awakened, of course you choose a natural birth. And it's, it's not just like, oh, once you're in a culture that normalizes this and expects this. I mean, now all of my female friends had home births, all of them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's normative for me, right? If my children were to go on knowing the people that we know to have babies, they would know that it's normative, okay? It doesn't have to be that way. You can literally come through the back door of science and that's what, not that I recommend this as the way because it's not really about science in the end, but even there you can find science to support, you know, your priorities of, you know, a, a living baby and a, a living mother the way that I did. And you can recognize the, the risks and the untold story of the adverse effects of these interventions. And you can see, hmm, maybe better off just letting it happen, even in a hospital setting. Although we know that these complications, it's kind of the funny thing about allopathy, right? It's like what they, they, I don't know, I was they. So whatever is, you know, whatever the doctor is purporting to help you avoid, mitigate, or resolve is actually perpetuated by the intervention. This is literally true for every single pharmaceutical, in my opinion, like whether it's a steroid or an antibiotic or an antidepressant. Why do you take the antidepressant? Because you're feeling depressed. What happens often when you take the antidepressant? You develop something called tardive dysphoria. What is tardive dysphoria? Depression. That doesn't go away, right? Like, and you look at, you know, Robert Whitaker's work and you see, oh, wow, it's actually the antidepressant that is you know, perpetuating this epidemic of mental health disability. How is that? That's called iatrogenesis. That is doctor induced harm. But really the cycle is so much more interesting. It's like some sort of universal law or something that you can't fight something and make it go away. Mm -hmm. That's not how that works. You fight it and it makes it bigger. It makes it persist. It makes it actually like grow a deep groove that then you're going to fall into every time you encounter the same conditions again. So how do you fight something? You jump tracks, right? You go to this place where that fight is not even relevant and you find freedom there. Mm, absolutely. And I agree with you that, that knowing that having the information um, is the way in for, for so many different kinds of people. I mean, when, when I offer that missing piece of the understanding of the hormonal physiology of birth and what is actually required to, uh, maintain the integrity of birth and ensure that it unfolds optimally for the family. When when the families that I support have that missing piece, a whole lot are just like, wait, why do we even need 
a midwife to come to the house, right? I mean, that, that question comes up a lot. And, and uh, it's just, it's that, it's that understanding that, that what matters most truly is how the birthing woman feels. And the deeper she can kind of surrender to that, like incredibly intelligent trance that will almost take over her and make sure that that everything kind of aligns to to open her up deeply to the birth process then then that that's birth in its integrity right and and really it's it's so simple and yet so forgotten that what preserves that integrity is a is a familiar environment is very much um uh an environment that's conducive to to an internal an internal a deep internal state and when you were talking about about the initiation for men and partners as well i always tell the the couples that i work with that really there's not i mean often of course it depends on the nature of the relationship they have but there's often no one better than the partner to hold that birthing woman as she's giving birth because they already have that nonverbal, the, that nonverbal relationship. They already, their, their bodies are already capable of kind of regulating each other beyond words, right? And that's what you want. That's the kind of presence that you want in the birthing space, right? Is someone who, who just through their presence alone and gaze and touch lets you know that you can not have to worry about the outside world and just completely, completely dive in. Yeah, I, I think part of why I sometimes am like, hmm, should a man be in the room? Should a man not be in the room? Should he just be at the door? You know, what is it? Part of that is is just how many hundreds of women I worked with in my practice where I was already fired up and turned on by this reclamation opportunity, right? And then their partners, were scared, right? Their partners were begrudgingly sort of like, I don't know, okay, I guess, yeah, all right, you're sure this is safe kind of energy, right? And so for a man, it seems like to get to a place, for a male partner, let's say, to get to a place where he deeply believes that this is what his woman came here to experience, right? She's designed for this. Um, there's so, I mean, where do you send, I mean, apart from, you know, to, to, to you and, and, you know, a handful, right? Like, where do we send men? Are there men who are helping other men understand this? I don't see that, you know, um, support system. So it's like, it's so new for men to be um, disabused of their allopathically induced, you know, um, assumptions around priorities and so that's why you know it's like tuning forks like you're saying like you know if if the man is resonating at this she's gonna take that on so when you have a partner who is like uh, you know this is going to be the most sacred experience of my life to, to bear witness to that power i know is in you and i've got you woman like you do not worry about a thing anything you need i'm here right like if he's that man yeah <laughs> like make sure he's like you know putting your hair up in a bun kind of a thing. Um, however, if, if there's a wobble in there, you want all the tuning forks, right? In your, in your literal room, in your literal space to be resonating at the same frequency, because that is what you will then tune to in those moments of, of wobble. I mean, I remember, cause it's just, it has the archetypal, um, you know, sort of stages of any initiation process, like, just before you're about to break through, what do we do? It's like a, a belittle death, right? Like we, we encounter that, that voice that says, I can't. That's the voice that's dying, right? And I remember in my home birth experience, it was, I had a water birth and I remember looking at my midwife and saying like, please tell me how much longer, like I can, and it wasn't even like a long birth, how much longer, like I, I, I can't do it. And it was lit. I don't even remember if I got the sentence out of my mouth before I started to crown. Right. And so that to, so what if she was like, Oh, okay, well, I don't know. Let me check your cervix and let me see how much, no, like all I needed was that, that gaze, like, 
oh girl, you've got this. <laughs> That's like literally all it takes. You're, you're doing amazingly. You've got this. And, uh, and then I tuned to that, right? Like, and then in that moment, oh, okay. Like my, my tuning fork got a little off. I don't know what I'm doing with this analogy, but like it kind of works. Right. And then I tuned to her very committed, you know, uh, frequency. Mm, totally. And I have this, um, I don't know if I can call it a theory, but I guess I have, no, it's not a theory. I have this intuitive sense that the best birth partner you can possibly have is actually someone who's willing to be body led. So someone who's not entering the space with their mind, but someone who can hold that tone of being fully body led with you. Um, and who can moan alongside you, who can just rock with you from side to side as you're rocking, who, you know, smiles or puts a warm hand on the partner who's just a little bit shaken by the whole experience, someone who's really willing to hold the tone of what it's like to just be with it, right? I mean, there's, there's to me, there's a huge loss, um, and I feel that you feel this too, but to me, there's a huge loss in collective loss, in us not allowing birth to unfold in its full primal glory, right? Like, I'm wondering if you've got any, like what you're feeling is, um, what do you feel may be the consequences for mothers, for babies, families, and society at large of not being able to fully move through this um, transformative rite of passage that is birth? Like what way what may may we be missing in our inability to be with birth as it is because we we will forever <laughs> absent another form of initiation recruit the reflex of control and power over when we could otherwise recruit a reflex of curiosity and faith. And that defines your entire life. Then you are living a life where you are managing all of those variables and you are looking to mommy medicine and daddy government to tell you how to feel safe, okay, and acceptable. And you ultimately abdicate your journey as an individual, right? Your self-expression and what? The gift, the gift that you came here to give that only you can give, right? And so if you are living that small control-based life, it only makes sense for you to do that, right? Because you, you don't even know that there's another way. That's the thing you don't even, you've never, it just almost silly or trite or like, like spiritual nonsense, you know, to imagine that there is a way to live life where anytime things go in a scary direction, anytime things go in a direction that isn't what you want, you recruit a part of you that says, Ooh, what's this about? Or like, Ooh, you know, how, it, how is it that I am narrating and why this situation, the way that I am, could I narrate it differently? Could I tell a different story? where I'm still the, the heroine, you know, where I'm still the hero, where everything is totally okay, where there's actually nothing to be afraid of, where I look around and I, and I recognize I'm totally fine, right? Like that is a practice that becomes available when you go through this kind of initiation, when you make contact with that, it's, it's God, I don't know. I mean, I don't use the word often because I, I remember being an atheist and I remember how it sounded, you know, to hear people use that word, but it's true. It is reconnecting with a, a meaningful reality rather than a random universe. And that is literally, those are the stakes we're talking about here, you know? So no wonder, you know, you want to dedicate your life to, to, to sounding this alarm and to really inspiring, right? Because that's the thing. If we go at this, from the angle of like, women, wake up. Don't you understand what's happening? Like you're giving your body over and your child's body over, you know, to the system and the system doesn't give a shit about you or your child. And look what's going to happen. Don't you know the statistics on these interventions and how dangerous they are to me to, 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 you know, it, it's to inspire around what is possible and not just in the experience, 
but the unfoldment of your entire life thereafter. It's, um, it's an entire, it's a portal, right? Like it's an entirely different framework for it. And, you know, I will say maybe just thinking about what you were describing with body led women. I love that. You know, I've, I've a couple of months ago, I started pole dancing and I have I saw um, all that and I love those videos so much. Yes. When I have a teacher, right. Who is just like an in-person teacher who's just a goddess. And she, um, she's so, in her body and she's so sensual and she's just so like I, I watch her and the feeling that I have when she's just demonstrating a little move in my body is like oh, I want that I want that I want the feeling that she gives me watching her in my own body right and when I first started working with her she would say like just see what happens go you know go walk around the pole and see what shapes you take and I was like frozen totally frozen I didn't even know and I've been a dancer my whole life and I didn't even know how to begin, I was so locked up. And what locks us up as women? What keeps us stuck and small? What keeps us in these ruts of what we call anxiety and depression? You know, ultimately is shame, in my opinion, is, is, is a shame wall, right? And that shame wall is enculturated. That shame wall says, go beyond here and you will be punished forever. And in my estimation, that punishment is literally death. Like what women walk around with afraid of every single day of our embodied lives is that we will be punished to the point of being killed. And that is a reality because all I have to do is displease a man anywhere on this plane and he could kill me with his bare hands. And that's the truth. And I'm a decently strong woman, right? It doesn't matter. This is encoded in my nervous system, in my body, right? So that shame wall says, don't be too sexual. Don't be too loud. Don't be too controlling. Don't let them see you sweat. Like, don't this, don't that, do that. And I, I manage that shame wall. And of course, then I attract partners who manage it with me. Right. Um, and I can't be my pole teacher. I can't be that woman moaning with me. You know, I can't be that woman normalizing what it is to just express through the body led by the body you know, free in the body. I can't be that until I work with that part. Not a lot of people are doing this work. Wait, maybe I should reframe that. Okay. I'm going to say people are doing this work, but it's not culturally dominant, right? So we don't even really have models. What is a body led woman? What does that even mean? I've, I've seen it up close and I've seen the contrasts of like, oh, I'm not there yet. I'm getting there. You know, I'm getting there and I'm seeing like, as I hold myself, when I explore what it is to do things I formerly thought were shameful and I create that masculine container for myself that is gazing upon me lovingly saying, I love everything you do. I love everything you do. You can't do anything wrong in my eyes. I am so here for you, Dylan. You don't have to worry about thing that's out there, right? As I create those conditions for myself, that part relaxes. That part says, oh, I can really come out now, right? And she bears all of these gifts of intuition and body-led guidance. But if, if that's what we're, we're talking about, right? And we have all these women who are up here trying to manage the experience of being in their female body. We've got our work cut out for ourselves, right? So if these elders, like if these women are out there, if these doulas and midwives and, you know, um, birth facilitators are out there and they've already done this work, yes, let's call them in. Let's surround ourselves with them because we will, those tuning forks, we will resonate with them. Once you, you feel what it is to be around a woman who's in her body that way, you want it. And, you and, that's the thing. and that's the thing is that it's not only a knowing of what is possible. It's a feeling of what yes. is possible. It's, it's, right? it's actually only a feeling. That's why I said, and that's why it makes me cry. You know, like when I talk about what women are capable of, you know, what it is to be a wild woman of this natural plane, you know, like, I cannot cry. It's a feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. It's like, what? <laughs> and there's grief there too, right? It's like, shit, I didn't know that. And I lived all these decades, like thinking I was just here to be like getting an A plus on life. There's like mm -hmm. this, like, oh, it's not regret. It's not remorse. It's a grief. It's like, what are we doing? Like, we're only here for so long. Like, this is it women like this is it don't forsake this 
And that's the exquisite thing is that the more of us, whether we're birth keepers or not, you know, if we're a friend, if we're a sister, if we're a woman walking the earth, the more we step into, into that embodied yes, you know, and that kind of body led sensation, the more we can demonstrate, we, the more we can offer that feeling of what is possible to another, right? Yeah, Whether we are her birth daughter or her sister or her friend that can kind of hold the tone for her of what is possible. Um, yeah. Oh, I really hope that, um, I mean, I'd love to have you on board. I'd love to properly interview you for Birth in Your Story. And, um, and yeah, it's just been such, such a great ride, such a good uh, initial conversation with you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for your time. Uh, just to give a sense to our audience of Birth in Your Story, this documentary film that I'm making, it really, truly does want to give people a sense of what is possible through the lived experiences of women and couples who are choosing to give birth beyond the medicalized model of birth. So we're following them uh, pre, like prenatally through the birth experience and postnatally as well. And we're speaking to a whole lot of brilliant people like you, uh, Kelly, who were once very much a part of the medical model of care. I'm thinking of Kimmy Johnson, a brilliant uh, midwife based in the UK. Um, she was very much a part of the system and who recognized, well, to her, she could serve families at a deeper level beyond it. So uh, we're gathering all these really valuable voices that are very familiar with both paradigms and that can really give us a sense of what is possible and what isn't within those two uh, models of care. And, uh, and yeah, thanks again so much for your time. I will say... Um, that we are crowdfunding the film at the moment. So our crowdfunding campaign, which will support us in continuing filming the, film, the, the documentary because we really want to keep it independent and unfiltered. We really want to say what we want to say within it uh, without limitations. Our campaign ends on the 30th of June. Um, so if you're moved to support us, if you're moved to help us tell this new story of birth, you can head to birthandnewstory.com and all donations are deeply valued thank you so much and uh and yeah thanks again kelly thank you thank you <laughs> thank you